All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And for those who don't know, that's all about bringing conservation, science, and adventure into classrooms around the world. This week, we're really excited because we are celebrating World Oceans Day, which is this Friday, by doing a week-long celebration featuring amazing ocean explorers and scientists from around the world. Uh, so we're going to get to our speaker in a second. Right now, we've got five classes joining us from across North America, so I'll give them a chance to do a bit of a shout-out. We've got Miss Brown's grade 11s in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> that was very low pitched. I like it. We've got Madame Zimmer's grade sixes in Milton, Ontario. Hi. 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 Hello. We've got Mrs. Jerome's grade sixes in Kelowna, British Columbia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, we got the mic working with them. Awesome. We've got Miss McKay's grade fours in Burlington, Ontario. Oh, Hi guys, we've got Miss Bauman's grade fives in Sherwood Park, Alberta. Got to demute their own mic, but they're there, they're waving, they're excited. And we just had another class join us a second ago. Uh, did they disappear again? They disappeared. Oh, maybe they're there. We have other classes. We'll get to that. I can't demute mics right now, but we will get to that. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We're joined live also in Burlington by Julia Barnes, who is the philosopher, director, producer, everything on Sea of Life. So when most of us see neat documentaries and amazing things, we go, how neat is that? Well, Julia actually at 16 years old said, I want to do something about it. Rob Stewart's revolution documentary. I don't want to steal all your thunder, uh, but decided to make her own film, an award-winning documentary, which she's going to talk about today. And so without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Julia. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to talk to you guys today. I'll start by sharing the slideshow. There we go. Awesome. So yeah, just like Jesse said, I uh, made a little documentary called Sea of Life. Maybe some of you guys have seen it. Um, it's a documentary all about the biggest issues facing the oceans, and it took me on this kind of crazy three-year journey to make the movie. So today I'm going to tell you guys all about the adventure that went into making this movie. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you guys are going to join me and make this an even bigger, more awesome adventure. Uh, so I started making this film when I was 16. I had just watched Rob Stewart's documentary called Revolution and learned for the first time that the world's coral reefs, rainforests, and fisheries are expected to be wiped out by the middle of the century. And as a kid who was totally in love with the natural world, I couldn't believe I hadn't known this was happening and I wanted to do everything I possibly could to turn things around. So about a week after watching Revolution, I bought a video camera and set out to make this movie. Um, at the time, I had no idea how to make a documentary. So the kind of plan that I had going into this was that I would go down to the Florida Keys film for about a week underwater, interview some scientists, and throw it all together into this movie that would show people the beauty and importance of the underwater world and hopefully inspire them to want to fight for its protection. So I went down to Florida with an underwater housing with the camera inside, jumped off the back of a boat, and I was underwater for the very first time in the ocean. You open your eyes underwater and it's kind of like a sensory overload. Everything looks, sounds, and feels different underwater. And on my first dive, I met two sharks, a sea turtle, and a stingray that was bigger than me. And I thought this was the coolest, most amazing thing I had ever done. I came up from this dive feeling so happy because it looked like I was well on my way to making this movie and saving the world that I love. But I went for dinner that night in the Florida Keys in a restaurant that was decorated with all sorts of images from the past, pictures from the Florida Keys of about 50 years ago. And the moment I laid eyes on one of those photographs, I realized that this beautiful world I thought I had been filming in was actually a degraded version of its former self. If you look at the types and the size of species that they were taking out of the ocean back then, you realize that the underwater world must have looked radically different. These are sawfish. They're a highly endangered species, and it would be incredibly rare to find one underwater today. But they were taking them out of the ocean in vast numbers back then. And the same thing was happening with all sorts of species. Different sharks um, that look way bigger than any shark you would see in the Florida Keys today. Uh, the same thing was happening with fish. These are grouper. They used to be massive, uh, but the largest one I've ever seen in Florida was about two feet long. So the underwater world had changed dramatically in the last 50 years. And the situation with coral reefs is no different. 
This is a picture that was taken in 1975 and another picture that was taken in exactly the same location in 2014. So you can see the extent to which the reef has degraded. And there are still some living coral reefs in the Florida Keys, but there is nothing like that 1975 picture. You know, that just doesn't exist anymore. And this is happening all around the world. So worldwide, 50% of coral reefs are gone and we're predicted to lose all of them by the middle of the century if we continue down this path. So I kind of realized after taking this trip to Florida that finding a healthy coral reef to film and making this movie was gonna be a lot harder than I ever imagined. And this little film that I thought I could finish in less than a year ended up taking three years and taking me to seven different countries all around the world on a kind of quest to figure out how we're gonna save coral reefs. So I ended up meeting with a lot of the world's top scientists on corals and, and learning a lot about them. So corals, as it turns out, are a really amazing ecosystem. Corals cover less than 1% of the seafloor, but they can be home to up to 30% of all life in the ocean at some stage in their life cycle. So corals are, are absolutely important to all life in the ocean. They have effects that ripple out far beyond just themselves. You know, there'll be species that are pelagic and that travel throughout the entire ocean, but they'll come into corals because they know they can get a, a cleaning station. And corals are kind of a nursery for a lot of fish species. So they're one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems on the planet. They can be home to thousands of different species and all these species live really closely together so they form complex and interconnected relationships. The corals are really beautiful and amazing ecosystem, but they're also in really big trouble right now because of something called ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is the biggest issue on the planet right now. Most of the carbon dioxide that we put up into the atmosphere doesn't just stay in the atmosphere. It gets absorbed into the ocean, making the ocean more acidic. And in a more acidic environment, any animal that builds a shell or a skeleton can't form. So that includes most life in the ocean. It, it includes coral reefs, but it also includes plankton. Plankton form the base of the entire marine food web. They feed the ocean, but they're also responsible for producing most of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. Uh, so plankton are really important to all life on the planet, and they're being wiped out right now. Uh, about 40% of plankton populations are already gone, and we're losing them at a rate of 1% per year. So I knew that ocean acidification was this massive issue, and I also knew that it was being caused by our release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So I set out to try and figure out how we're going to curb those emissions. And what I learned was that a lot of uh, environmental organizations had been working to reduce carbon dioxide emissions for decades. So when I found out that these groups were organizing the largest rally for the environment in history, I jumped at the opportunity to join them. I got on a bus with a group called Toronto 350 and went down to New York City for the People's Climate March. Governments were meeting in New York for a pretty massive climate summit and 400,000 people from across North America gathered in New York to send a message to those governments that there's enormous public support for a reduction in carbon emissions and that we want a living world. Despite this, governments didn't come to an agreement that day. But there was a lot of hope that we were building pressure for the next big environmental conference called COP21, which was coming up in Paris. And in the year leading up to COP21, people rallied in different cities all around the world, putting pressure on these governments. Just to give you a little bit of a backstory on COP conferences, for the previous 20 years, governments had been meeting and meeting and meeting and failing and failing and failing to come to an agreement. But then COP21 came around and all of a sudden people started talking, maybe this was going to be the year, governments were finally going to do it and get an agreement to reduce emissions. And they did. After 20 years of negotiations, governments finally came to an agreement to reduce emissions of CO2. People were celebrating this in the streets. They thought it was an enormous success for the environmental movement. But for a lot of us who understood the conditions that are necessary for life to continue in the ocean, we realized that this wasn't really a success at all. The Paris Agreement is a non-legally binding voluntary agreement among governments of the world to limit warming to two degrees Celsius. And we know that coral reefs can't survive warming above 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the Paris Agreement, even if every government sticks to the targets that they, they said they would, isn't going to be enough to save life in the ocean. 
And as I continued ripping around the world, interviewing scientists and making this movie, I learned something about ocean acidification that I had never known before. There's a lag time between the time it takes the carbon dioxide we put up into the atmosphere to get absorbed into the ocean. And what that means is that even if we stopped producing carbon dioxide emissions today, there's so much carbon in the atmosphere already that ocean acidification could continue for the next 20 or 30 years. So a lot of the world's top scientists on coral reefs were predicting that even if we had a best case scenario, even if we uh, dropped emissions to zero today, ocean acidification was going to continue into the future and we were going to wipe out all the world's coral reefs, no matter what. And for me, having just spent a year and a half of my life at this point, pouring all my time and energy into making this movie, thinking I was going to save coral reefs, this was about the most devastating thing I could have heard. So I kind of had to figure out whether there was any point in continuing to make this movie, thinking that we're going to lose all the world's coral reefs no matter what we do. But the one person who I needed to talk to to help me figure that out was Rob Stewart. He was kind of my hero and mentor in all of this. And he's the guy who inspired me to make this movie. So I sat down with Rob, asked him about lag time and ocean acidification, and he said, we can still turn things around for coral reefs. It just means we have to sequester carbon dioxide. We have to pull carbon out of the atmosphere before it goes into the ocean, rather than just stopping emissions. So it was going to be a little bit more complex, but still something that we can turn around and get right. And we could still save all the world's coral reefs. So I started looking into carbon sequestration. We all kind of understand that plants sequester carbon dioxide. When they photosynthesize, they release oxygen, they pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Right now, 75% of the forests are gone from the land. So could you imagine how much carbon we could sequester if we let that life come back? Uh, but what most people don't realize is that fish also sequester carbon. It's a little known fact, but deep sea fish, when they sink to the bottom of the ocean, they pull carbon down with them. And there's a lot of cycles in the ocean that involve uh, species coming up from the bottom of the ocean to the surface, feeding on the plant life there, and then going back down to the ocean, to the bottom of the ocean, excreting their waste where it kind of sinks and, and gets sequestered. So um, I was talking to somebody recently about how fish sequester carbon and he said that fish are 10 times more valuable in the ocean as carbon sequesters than they are on your plate. So that gives you some kind of a sense of, of the scale of this. Apparently, if we were to let all the fish come back to the ocean, if we were to let the forests come back to the land, we could sequester more carbon dioxide than what we've emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So there's an enormous potential to, to get things right with carbon sequestration. And we know from examples of places where people have stopped fishing that life can come back to the ocean really quickly. So there's a place called Cabo Pumo in Mexico. It was once a fishing village, but they had so heavily overfished the ocean that there was almost nothing left. So the people decided to create a marine protected area. They banned fishing, and within 10 years of doing so, the biomass, the amount of life in the ocean, increased by 450%. Fish were thriving again in Cabo. And by the time I got there, 20 years after Cabo Pumo had been declared a marine protected area, the ocean was teeming with life. It was one of the most abundant, beautiful places I had ever been to underwater. I remember being on a dive, spinning around in a circle, and there were fish all around me, just swarming. I called it a fish tornado because there were so many of them. Uh, so we know that given the chance, life will come back to the ocean. But right now we've got industrial fisheries which are just wiping out and destroying life in the ocean. 90% uh, of all large fish in the ocean have been wiped out within the span of about 50 years. And this is continuing on a massive scale. Every year, industrial fisheries waste 54 billion pounds of fish as bycatch, fish who are caught, taken out of the ocean, and thrown back because they weren't the target species. Um, industrial fisheries uh, waste an, an enormous amount of fish, and, and a lot of the fish that are taken out of the ocean every year aren't eaten by humans, they're being fed to livestock. So now we've got pigs, cows, chickens, and house cats are eating more fish than all the world's sharks. So the way that we're interacting with the natural world is, is absolutely insane and it can't continue. We've wiped out most of the world we depend on for survival and we're on track to lose everything by the middle of the century if we continue down this path. 
By 2048, scientists are predicting a world with no fish, no rainforests, no reefs, and 9 billion people fighting each other over what remains. This does not look good. We can't continue doing what we've been doing. We can't scoop out the oceans and cut down the forests and expect to be able to survive. So we've got to change everything. And I don't think that change is going to happen because governments decide the right things. I think it's going to happen because passionate people decide to dedicate their lives to fighting for the world we depend on. What the ocean needs right now is heroes. And that can be you guys. And it has to be you guys because it's your future that's in jeopardy. Everything we love and everything we depend on is in danger of being wiped out within our lifetimes. So I think what the world needs right now is heroes, and I hope that you guys are going to join me in the biggest battle ever fought to save life on Earth. The world has never needed you more. Thank you. I'm going to try and end the screen share now. There we go. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. That was outstanding. Uh, all right. Well, we're going to go to Q&A before we dive into the questions. There are some groups watching online on YouTube. You guys can send in questions, too, and I can pass them along to Julia. So if you want to do that, little chat bar on the right, go right ahead. Uh, first, and to introduce them properly, so we have Miss Petrie's grade 11 class from Oshawa, Ontario. Uh, the thing with you guys, you have to demute your own mic, so a little microphone symbol at the top of your screen. But if you guys have any questions and wanted to come up and ask them, uh, you can go right ahead. So we'll get back to you guys in just a second. We'll start with Ms. Brown's class in San Antonio. If you have questions, come on up. Okay, do we need to unmute? No, you're good. Okay. Hold on one second. <laughs> What, what is a, like the most memorable experience filming underwater? Hmm, the most memorable experience filming underwater. Um, probably diving with great hammerhead sharks because they're my favorite species of shark. So getting to be underwater with them was really cool. It was kind of, it all happened really quickly. At the end of making this movie, I realized that I didn't have a really great like opening or ending sequence. So I was kind of scrambling to figure out what I was going to do. I knew that I wanted it to include sharks. I wanted to show a, a peaceful human shark interaction and kind of get people into the ocean with this really cool species. But I thought that the season for filming great hammerheads was over so it was really at the last minute I just called up this company I'm like are you still doing dives with this species and it was like I got in on the last possible day that you could dive with them so I was really lucky I showed up and and as soon as the boat went up there the hammerheads came and and they stayed with me all day so it was really awesome to be able to film with them yeah, yeah. well cool. is that the one you guys have the the feature of their of the cover of the movie or the trailer is it in there yeah that's the one perfect yeah. all right uh, let's go to Madame Zimmer's class. Do you guys have a question? Okay, let's go. Who's first? Okay, we've got someone. Who's first? What was it that made you take an interest in the natural world? What and who was it that inspired you to be so passionate about this? Um, I had always been in love with the natural world ever since I was a little kid. It was just something that was really innate in me. I would run around chasing frogs and snakes and bugs and every creature that lived around where I live. I, I was fascinated with life in all forms. But it wasn't until I watched Rob Stewart's documentary Revolution that I realized that this world that I love was in jeopardy. So it was Rob and his amazing documentaries that inspired me to want to fight for its protection and, and to get involved in the ocean and to do filmmaking. Cool. Great answer. All right. Let's go to Ms. Jerome's class. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what can we do in our lives to help the ocean? What can you do to help the ocean? First of all, I think it's really important to realize that you have an enormous amount of power. Even as students, you have just as much power as anybody else. So I always encourage people do the biggest thing you can possibly think of. Don't limit yourself to, to small things, personal lifestyle changes, because the scale of the problem is really massive. So I think what we need right now is people rising to the challenge and, and being creative, use whatever skills or talents you have and, and go to work to fight for this planet. And yeah, just, just do the biggest thing you think that will actually make a difference. It could be anything. The world needs everything right now. It needs films, it needs art, it needs music, it needs people writing and protesting and, and just doing 
any kind of skill you can imagine could benefit this cause. So yeah, figure out what you're passionate about, figure out what you're good at and combine those and, and do something awesome. Julie, are you passionate about this? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, just a little. Uh, all right, uh, let's go. I'm gonna go to Miss McKay's class in a second. Just a note for Miss Petrie's class and Miss Bowman's class. You guys will have to demute your own mics. Uh, just again, microphone symbol at the top of your screen. I'll prompt you in a minute. Uh, first, though, Miss McKay's class. Are the waves damaging the coral reefs? Because waves are very strong and coral reefs are kind of weak. Yeah. Waves can damage coral reefs, for sure, if you get really extreme weather. I mean, corals typically are living in places where they don't get too much damage from waves because uh, if they were getting damaged all the time, they couldn't survive there. But typically, corals choose to live in places where there's the least amount of stressors on them. But if you get really extreme weather, something like a hurricane comes in, it can cause damage to coral reefs. But typically, corals choose to position themselves in places where they can recover from whatever damages come their way. It's more the, these introduced newer um, stressors that are being caused by human activity that are really harmful to corals. All right, let's go to Miss Bowman's class. Do you guys want to come on up and ask a question? Uh, go for it. Yep, you're good. Didn't hear the question. Yeah, come on, either closer to the camera or the teacher can repeat it, guys. Do sharks try to eat you? Do sharks try to eat you? No. Um, sharks are pretty terrified of people. We're kind of this foreign object in the ocean. They've never seen anything like us before. So when you go into the ocean and you try and swim the sharks, um, if you don't have bait with you, typically you swim towards the shark and it'll swim away in the opposite direction. They're pretty freaked out about people. So the way that we get sharks to come in close to us and interact with us is by putting bait in the water. And that's about the only way that you can get them to come in and have these really close interactions. Otherwise, they don't want anything to do with you. They're pretty terrified. I love how every ocean hangout we ever do has this question. It's always good when the scientist researcher can share that they're not they're not out to get you. Uh, yeah. All right, Miss Petrie's class. Do you guys want to go? All right, Rosetta. Hi. Um, thank you, Julia. Uh, I would like to know why are there not more government and or more enforcement in the waters to ensure that the ocean life is better protected? Yeah, I wish I knew. Um, that's a good question for governments. <laughs> I think maybe we should all send emails after this and ask them why. I don't know. I mean, obviously, this should be a huge priority because the ocean is the most important ecosystem for the survival of life on Earth. It gives us so much of what we need to survive. It gives us our oxygen. It gives a lot of people food and it regulates the temperature of the earth. So it should be something that we're really focusing on, that we're really enforcing, but it's just not happening. It's crazy the amount of destruction that, that is allowed to go on. And so much illegal activity happening in the ocean that could be stopped if there was enforcement, but it just most of the time is not there. So yeah, ask the government and I don't know. <laughs> so that's the thing that they can do too, is write letters, run for office, yeah, do all those things to actually be the change that you want to be rather than hope for it to you know, come on the wind. All right. Uh, Julia, do you have time for another round of questions? For sure. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, let's go back to Miss Brown's class then. And if you have another one, come on up. Uh, they want to know how you learned how to film underwater. Where did you learn that skill? Yeah, sure. How did I learn how to film underwater? It was pretty much all trial and error. So I just, uh, Bought a camera, bought an underwater housing for that camera, and then threw myself off the back of a boat with this camera and tried to figure it all out. You know, I thought it would be a lot easier than it was. It, it ended up being pretty difficult, you know. And the first couple of times I was underwater, I shot things that were completely out of focus, or I would have uh, dust on the back of my lens. I didn't realize but you have to be super scrutinous when you're uh, filming. You have to clean off your lens all the time. So yeah, there was a learning curve to it, but it was just, you know, try it a couple of times and, and realize what the mistakes are, and then you correct for those, and, and, and I ended up learning pretty quickly trial, how to do it right. Trial by fire in the water. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go back to Madame Zimmer's class. Yep, you're good. I can't go over there. Oh, my camera facing you. 
How might and how do you hope the movie you made influence people in the world and make them realize that what they are doing is bad for the environment? How do I hope the movie will influence people? Um, I hope to get the movie seen by as many kids as possible. So if you guys, teachers are watching this, for sure, show the movie to your classes. Um, that's basically been my main goal in all of this. And I, I've gotten it seen in a lot of schools around Ontario and, and different places in the world. And I really want young people to understand that, that the world we depend on is in jeopardy and that our futures are, are very much in jeopardy unless we do something to turn things around. Because I don't see that these changes are happening on any other kind of level. So I think it's really up to us. We've got to start taking things into our own hands and enforcing the kind of change that we want to see. So I hope to inspire a lot more people to get involved and, and to care about the ocean and to want to protect it because it's super important. Julia, yeah. is there a place where people can go and download the movie or watch the movie, stream it? Like, what's, what are the options out there? Yeah, if you go to seeoflifemovie.com, you can uh, buy or rent the movie or you can order the DVD. Excellent. All right, let's go to Miss Jerome's class. You guys have a question? Come on up. So, how do microplastics from plastic water bottles affect the coral reefs? How do microplastics affect the coral reefs? Yeah, I'm not too much of an expert on this, but I did see an article recently about the fact that if there's plastic touching corals, they tend to be a lot more prone to diseases. So it's not something that I spent a lot of time um, researching because when I was making this documentary, plastic wasn't one of those issues that was hugely in the media the way it is right now. But it, it seems like it's affecting them very much in, in a way that it, it somehow stresses them out so that if a disease comes along, they, they can get affected by it much more easily than it would if, if they weren't being touched by plastic. So it's definitely having a, a very detrimental impact on corals. Excellent. Speaking of plastic, we've dealt with that in all the hangouts today. So there's lots of resources, as you said, Julie, about plastic right now. And Canada is working to try and at least talk about commitments to solve that. Whether it happens or not, we'll see. But uh, good question. All right, Miss McKay's class, if you guys want to come up. What was your scariest moment underwater? Hmm. What was my scariest moment underwater? Um, one of the times when I was on a dive, my weight belt started slipping off. So the weight belt is the thing that keeps you underwater and, and keeps you from floating to the surface. And if you come up too quickly, you can your lungs can literally burst because you're, you're supposed to go ascend to the surface very slowly. So I started floating up while I was on this dive and I was like, I couldn't figure out what was happening. So I was just kicking like crazy to try and, and stay down. And then finally the... Um, guide who was on this dive with me realized what was going on and he, he comes and attaches my weight belt back onto me but yeah that, that was that was a bit freaky I didn't realize at the time how scary that situation was until until after it was kind of sorted out and then I was like oh yeah that could have ended really bad <laughs> but fortunately it, it worked out lungs bursting are a lot worse than sharks that aren't going to attack you yeah, yeah. all right Miss Bauman's class so guys come on up and, and demute again if you have a second question Go right ahead how do you get involved with sharks? How do you get involved with sharks? Is that the question? Um, there's lots of different places where you can dive with sharks, if that's something that you're looking to do. In the Bahamas, they do a lot of shark diving. It's a shark sanctuary, so the sharks are completely protected there. Uh, so you can see a lot of different species. You can see things like oceanic white tips, which are super endangered. Anywhere else in the ocean, you're not likely to see them. Um, great hammerheads are there, tiger sharks, and uh, Caribbean reef sharks are the most common ones that you can find there. Uh, that's probably the best place to get involved with sharks physically in the ocean. And if you want to get involved with shark conservation, there's great groups like Fin Free, uh, United Conservationists, all these kind of groups that were started by Rob Stewart. They're still going on and, and they're working to get shark fin banned in all different places and to save sharks and protect them in the ocean. Do you know how old you have to be to get a scuba license? How old you have to be to go scuba diving? I think it's about 13 to get your um, scuba diving certification, but if you're younger than that, you can go on certain kind of specialty dives as long as there's like more conditions on it. Like you have to go down with a, a like dive master and you have to always be holding their hand or something like that. But yeah, I think you can get in the ocean pretty, pretty young on diving. You just have to be 13 to get your certification. Excellent. Uh, all yeah. right, then we'll finish off back with Miss Petrie's group. Uh, if you guys have a second question, uh, 
we can end off with that. Sure. Mike or Abdul, which one of you? Uh, do you find that due to your advocacy, some organizations attack your credibility? Do organizations attack my credibility? Nope. Nobody has yet. Everyone has been super supportive. And I think, you know, in this movement, we're all kind of working toward the same goal. And uh, we're all just interested in saving the ocean. So everybody's super helpful. Um, I've had a lot of organizations do screenings of my movie and uh, just generally offer their support. I haven't had anyone attack my credibility. Outstanding. That's really good to hear. All right. Uh, so really at the end of every hangout, what we do is we're going to demute everyone's mic and everyone can join me in saying a huge thank you to you for joining us today. So thank you so much, Julia. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the classes, if you guys want to join us for the rest of the week, again, we've got 50 hangouts all week long. So we look forward to seeing you soon. And Julia, you are welcome back anytime. That was outstanding. Thank you. So all right. much. Thank you. All right.